And on today's show, why women must change their behavior towards money. Part four of this week's series on financial planning for women with registered investment advisor and certified financial planner, Heather Coulter. Hi everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and contributing author to Innsmark, Life Specs and Backroom Technician. Let's get down to business. Well, welcome, Heather. Thank you. To day yeah, four. I Way know. to go. Thank you. Well, we're talking about investment behavior for women, and boy, I think this is one area where you can really help a lot of consumers, and people are always looking for, wow, women are the largest demographic. This area about changing behavior, mm -hmm. it's not so much knowledge. It's not, I'm not doing the math right. I think women have all that down. It's behavioral issues. Right. And this is where we all get in trouble. We, have, we, we were taught wrong. Maybe we have bad practices, bad behavior. Let's walk through this because you put on your first part here, it's intimidating. I say it's always intimidating, it especially if you've been put in the position, you have to run your own finances now. Right. Nobody's going to do it for you. Yes, it's very intimidating, especially for women. Um, the stock market is a whole different oh. world. You can't the bear market, the bull market, the green and the mm -hmm. red, and it's just so fast moving in pace. It's a whole different world. And that can be very intimidating to women. How do I learn enough to know that I'm not being treated wrongly by an advisor. How, you know what I'm saying? How do, I, how do I learn enough to know that? Well, women are very intuitive, so you definitely need some advice on this area. So don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, you need to interview. You need to make sure that uh, they can communicate mm -hmm. the way that you needed to be communicated with, that they listen to you, they get you, they understand what your goals and objectives mm -hmm. are for this account or why you're investing. A lot of women need to understand um, it needs to be something measurable. They need to understand what they're trying to achieve so mm -hmm. they can relate to what they're doing, what they're working towards. How do I vet an advisor before he, before he even gets into my room or she gets in her room for me to even see him eye to eye? Am I trolling the web? Am I doing a little investigation on LinkedIn and things of that nature? Sure. I mean, different generations are going to do it differently. Mm -hmm. Some are just going to uh, trust whatever personal referral they get from uh, a trusted friend. Third party referral? Sure. And then you've got a Gen X generation like myself mm -hmm. who would definitely go out online or someone even younger than myself. Mm -hmm. And they would definitely want to see uh, credentials. What are they about? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the ideal client that they work with? Can they work with me? Do they understand mm -hmm. me? Will they understand mm -hmm. me? The earlier in the week, I, and I've heard you talk about this before, do they get me? That's mm -hmm. what you say. Do they get me? Right. And when I'm looking at, I'm done with my LinkedIn, I've got three or four people I'm going to interview. What's the number one thing that I should be looking for? Especially, you said there's an intuitive sense about it. Mm -hmm. What is that intuitive sense? What should I be looking for to keep my radar up? It basically comes down to listening. You're not talking down to me. You're hearing me. Mm -hmm. You know, the communication again. So the person, the advisor could be a Rhodes Scholar. He could yeah. have credentials. Yeah. He could have all these things working for him. But if he's not listening... Right. And, and being able to communicate the way that I want to be communicated mm -hmm. about. If you're talking up here, I'm not going to understand what you're doing. It's going to be hard for me to trust you. I think there's a thin line between what we're talking about and dating. Yeah. <laughs> I, think there's a thin yeah. Line. I think there's a thin line. Right. Getting to know each other. Talking about trust, how, when you, especially if you went through a divorce, if you, went, if you lost your husband, uh, if you're remarried again... How do you gain the kind of confidence to put trust in somebody, especially, like you said, like the stock market, asset mm -hmm. allocation of my 401k? I mean, a lot, of, a lot of women I meet are already in defined contribution plans, like a 401k. Mm -hmm. They don't know, hey, is this a good asset allocation? I have never done a risk tolerance test. I don't know anything about that. How do I start to move into the basics? Because women are a growing force. They already run the show at home. Right. They're now collecting assets. I mean, remember, World War II and Korean guys, they're all gone for, for the most part. So all this money is being shifted to their surviving female spouses. They're big numbers. Right, yeah. There's like $41 trillion coming down to the next generation. Wow. So 70% of that actually is daughters that are going to be inheriting that. Um, there's $6 trillion coming in earned income from women globally over the next mm -hmm. few years. That's a huge amount. Um, so yeah, they need to start somewhere. They need mm -hmm. to start simple. They need to, to, to put something into their 401k to at least, uh, at least as much mm -hmm. as the employer will match them. When you bring this up to people, do you see them, is this new information or are you just confirming what they already knew? When you're, when you're visiting with a, uh, with a woman. They probably have heard it before, but now they're trying to apply it to themselves. Okay. In your case, you've, you've went through suddenly single. You mm -hmm. went through that. How was that for you? Now, Chris, you're already a CFP, right? You're already, you're already a person. Not yet. I was actually, I, I started the CFP program actually after my divorce. So, mm -hmm. so how was that for you? Because you're, you lived what we're talking about. 
I did. So what, which part of it do you want to know about Just how it was how for did, me? How, for finance, how did you say, hey, listen, I'm on my own now. How do I do this? Talk about um, just the awareness again. It was a fi- I had to become completely financially independent. Um, I had to understand my financial awareness, and I had to uh, be forced into taking control of everything, which was budget and trying to save and get that emergency savings going and to, um, to participate in my employer 401k contribution. So I started somewhere, mm-hmm. and I stayed, kept it simple. How long did it take you from a learning curve? It took you a little while, though. Oh, of course. It takes some time, yes. I'm trying to figure out someday someday we'll have to put together a fast track, something that's doable, simple, safe, and easy to do, so Mm -hmm. you at least have a starting point. It's not the end point, but it's a good starting point. We come back from the break. We're going to continue looking at the behavior of women towards money and get more of insight from Heather right after the break. It's not how much money you make for your clients, it's how much money they get to keep, especially in retirement. But retirement income could cause Social Security benefits to be taxed. One tax advantage alternative is life insurance designed as a non-modified endowment contract that can generate tax-free income without taxing Social Security benefits. These contracts offer differing funding options depending upon your client's risk tolerance. For more information on how life insurance can be part of your retirement planning, just email me at steve at downtobusiness.tv. Brought to you by Ash Brokerage, the practice enhancement company. Welcome back to our second segment. Of course, we're with Heather Coulter, RIA and CFP, and we're talking about financial behavior. Of course, this isn't exclusive to women. Guys have a lot of lousy <laughs> behaviors, I have to say. But we're trying to what we're trying to do is we're trying to come into certain areas where we can at least try to lay down some groundwork, foundational. Now, some of this is psychological. Yeah. People are people want to preserve. Well, I think women, or you tell me, I think women are more preservation of principle people. Yes, very much. They like to preserve. They tend to be much more conservative, conservative. that way. Mm-hmm. By the way, the last 401k, this is a little side note, the last 401k, I looked at it, I looked at his 401k and hers. I made them both do a risk tolerance test. Yeah. Hers was very close to her allocation model. His was way off. So the, I think guys are basically psychopathic liars on their finance <laughs> just because they never match up to their, their risk tolerance. Sure. Now talk about a little bit about some of their emotional reactions because, you know, people are, oh, the market's going down. And they just start bailing out and cashing out. Well, sure. A lot of us do that. And, mm. you know, even women, obviously women, too. Um, so they get nervous. So all of a sudden you hear all the buzz and the market's going down and they don't quite understand mm. it all. So what do they do? They pull out because they want to preserve. They don't want to lose anything. Mm. Um, so then what happens? Now the buzz is things are going well, you know, the, the economy is doing better, mm-hmm. everything's going up. So now they go up. So what happens to everybody? We pull mm-hmm. out and we, we buy high and we sell low. Well, I was thinking about this next topic when you say, learn what your financial personality is. This is like, mm-hmm. writing, what is your love language? You know? Right, exactly. Yeah, so what is your financial <laughs> personality? So we right. have financial personalities. Everybody has a financial personality. And this is becoming more and more of the, the hip thing. The whole behavioral financial mm-hmm. is really kind of coming out now. Um, but you need to understand what your financial personality is. And then you need more of a professional advisor mm-hmm. to help you with, with more to it than that. So understand if you're a spender mm-hmm. or a saver, but the financial financial advisor can help you with risk tolerance, help you understand mm. the, the time horizon, all the other things that mm. go along with putting together that asset allocation that's proper for you. Well, I love this line here t- talking about women need to understand more than the more mm-hmm. why they need to invest. Why do right. I need to do this? Right. It's a little bit, uh, they need, usually they need someone maybe to hold them more accountable. They maybe need a little mm-hmm. uh, hand holding. They need to measure it somehow. They need to understand what they're trying to achieve by investing. Let's go to the next part here, because I think this also brings out some of the issues that we're talking about. It's kind of basic, but I still think it's worth looking at. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's look at the key. The, 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 the big issue of key to wealth is to start early. So let's just right. say I'm with a millennial gal, right? Right. Who is single right now. Right. She hasn't married. She mm-hmm. hasn't been divorced. She's not cohabitating yet. Okay. So the key to building wealth is to start early. Yeah. Now, when you say, I've heard you say this before, you know, start simple, starts, you know, yeah, start, you know, start small, small, start simple, simple start, start somewhere. somewhere. Right. Yes. So here we are. Let's pay ourselves first. How unique is that? You know, right. let's just pay ourselves exactly. first. Exactly. Exactly. They have to do that. You just need to start somewhere. And, and a lot of us is usually with our employer plan. So just participate mm-hmm. that at least as much as the percentage that the employer is willing mm-hmm. to match. So if they're matching 3%, if you're not at least contributing that much and taking advantage of that matching, it's mm-hmm. like leaving free money on the table. Well, there's a lot of things competing for our dollar. Yeah. The budget's always pulling yes. at us. There's emergencies, mm-hmm. things we didn't foresee. Right. But we're trying to learn how to do it. And speaking of budgets, 
I think most people, most advisors have left the budgetary issues aside. They're only looking for assets under allocation, where you guys are really a full planner. Yeah. You're looking at budget, debt reduction. You're looking at things that I don't see normal people do. Absolutely. We look at all of it. We're a comprehensive financial planners, and we definitely need to understand uh, the whole picture and what those goals and objectives, and again, the time horizon, mm -hmm. so we can help them with the proper asset allocation to meet those goals. A lot of times, people... Um, might be more of a risk taker mm -hmm. than they should be. Their capacity to take it's not there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're maybe too conservative and the time horizon is so long, we might be able mm -hmm. to kind of advise them to go a little bit more aggressive because they do mm -hmm. have the capacity to take risk. So there's a lot more to it. If you saw a woman taking a risk tolerance test mm -hmm. and that test showed that she had a certain profile, would you try to maintain that profile? I mean, you're, we're giving them a test for a reason. Right. We're trying to see if they really understand their own psychological profile. Do you think women see themselves more uh, in reality more than men? I know that's kind of a loaded question. See themselves but more conservative? More, more, no, more what? reality. Whatever their risk oh. tolerance test results are, that is their result. They're pretty good about that. Yeah, their perception might be that. So it, it does, like I mentioned, we would have to educate mm -hmm. them when it comes to there's a lot more to investing than just your risk profile. Mm -hmm. So what that score is doesn't always drive what that allocation properly should be. I love this question because this is a big question depending upon age, depending upon how long before I retire, how long my job's going to last. How much equity should I be exposed to? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I want to make returns. Right. But if I want to make returns, I have to be exposed to a little bit of, of equity. It could be a downside here. Right, exactly. How do I talk about that from a woman's perspective, knowing that one of the key, at least in my experience, preservation of principles is a big issue? Yeah, preservation, obviously, they, they have a hard time trying to lose. So sometimes they don't want to lose anything. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you do have to, again, educate them where... Yeah, there's a paper up and down on some of those things, but it's until you actually realize the loss or the gain. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to educate them on that. And then again, you have to maybe, if they're in their 40s and they want to preserve, and that you have to educate that they have to stay ahead of inflation. And the only way to do that is to have a portion of mm -hmm. your um, alloc your portfolio in the stock market. So there's a lot mm -hmm. there's a lot there. And so if you educate them, they get it. But you're right, they mm -hmm. usually tend to be a little more preserve it, don't want to mm -hmm. lose anything. I understand that. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Remember, before moving forward with any of the ideas that we have on the show, always consult your tax advisor, legal counsel, or your broker dealer compliance officer. Missed an episode? Just go out to our video archives. And remember, you could be wiser as an educated advisor. I'm Steve Savant. We'll see you tomorrow.